First up this week, some stories from the coolinterestingstuff.com website. The first is about that mysterious white blob on Ceres. You might have seen it going around on the internet. This photograph taken by NASA of the dwarf planet Ceres and this unusual white blob. The story is entitled, What is that mysterious white blob on Ceres? An alien city? A strange flickering white blotch found on the dwarf planet Ceres by a NASA spacecraft has scientists scratching their heads. The white spot on Ceres in a series of new photos taken on January 13 by NASA's Dawn spacecraft, which is rapidly approaching the round dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. But when the initial photo was released on Monday, January 19, the Dawn scientists gave no indication of what the white dot might be. Yes, we can confirm that it is something on Ceres that reflects more sunlight, but what that is remains a mystery. Mark Raymond, mission director and chief engineer for the Dawn mission, told Space.com. The new images show areas of light and dark on the face of Ceres, which indicate surface features like craters. But at the moment, none of the specific features can be resolved, including the white spot. We do not know what the white spot is, but it's certainly intriguing, Raymond says. In fact, it makes you want to send a spacecraft there to find out. And of course, that is exactly what we are doing. So as dawn brings Ceres into sharper focus, we will be able to see with exquisite detail what the white spot is. Ceres is a unique object in our solar system. It is the largest object in the asteroid belt and is classified as an asteroid. It is simultaneously classified as a dwarf planet at about 590 miles across. Ceres is the smallest known dwarf planet in the solar system. And also from the coolinterestingstuff.com, alien spacecraft is spotted orbiting asteroid. Does this new NASA picture show an alien spacecraft? This intriguing NASA image of an asteroid taken as it passes Earth clearly shows something strange. You can see in the picture of asteroid 2004 BL86, taken by NASA's Deep Space Network, that it is clearly a diamond-shaped craft, likely alien in origin. However, the Space Agency has offered a more rational explanation revealing that the asteroid had its own moon, something they say is extremely common. A NASA spokesman said, In the near-Earth population, about 16% of asteroids that are about 655 feet or larger are a binary, the primary asteroid with the smaller asteroid moon orbiting it, or even triple systems, two moons. According to UFO sightings daily, They are, well, this asteroid has a UFO flying around it. We can see from the detailed photo that the craft is diamond-shaped and flat. NASA, of course, goes on to say that this flat object, which does not flip over end, is a moon. Wrong. Any moon this thin would be tumbling end over end. This object is keeping itself steady, flying like a ship would in space. If you'd like to see the photograph and make up your own mind, it's at the show notes at www.origins.info. Click on the links to the Mysteries Abound show notes, the links in episode 104, and then the link to this article. Just sitting here looking at the photograph now, I'm not quite sure how they can say it's diamond-shaped or flat, but it definitely is a little bit unusual. To me, it looks a little bit like a comet. Anyway, if you're not quite sure, visit the show notes, look at the photograph, and make up your own mind. Thirdly, from the CoolInterestingStuff.com website, the seventh suns will turn into werewolves. Argentina has a superstition that seventh suns will turn into werewolves. According to the myth, the seventh sun of the seventh sun is particularly at risk and more prone to fall victim to the curse. In Argentina, the werewolf is referred to as El Lobizon, 
In Paraguay, it goes by the name of Luizon, and in Brazil, it's called the Lobisomen. The Independent elaborates on the South American legend. The werewolf-like creature shows its true nature on the first Friday after the boy's 13th birthday. The legend says, turning the boy into a demon at midnight during every full moon, doomed to hunt and kill before returning to human form. As well as feeding on excrement, unbaptized babies and the flesh of the recently dead, the Lobison was said to be unnaturally strong and able to spread its curse with a bite. In Garani mythology, the Lobison is the offspring of Tao, an evil spirit, and Karana, a mortal woman. In the cultures that believe in the Lobison, that creature acts as a sort of grim reaper, whose mere presence means that death will soon befall those it comes into contact with. The fear of this curse was so acute in Argentina that families sometimes murdered their seventh sons to prevent the legend from becoming true. So in 1907, in an attempt to stop this practice, the Argentinian president began adopting seventh sons, which the president insisted would stop the curse. In 1973, for unknown reasons, the presidential adoption tradition was also extended to seventh daughters. And from the popsci.com.au website, a story by Kelsey Atherton. Captured on Google Earth, mysterious barcode patterns strewn across US land. Consider it a barcode for bombers, an eye test for spy planes. Across empty stretches of the United States, an odd Cold War artifact persists. It is a series of asphalt rectangles coded in patterns of black and white paint. Based on the 1951 US Air Force Resolution Test Chart, the barcode-like patterns were used to test the ability and resolution of film cameras carried by aeroplanes. Known as tri-bar photo targets and largely concentrated in the Mojave Desert, they were used for half a century to test the reliability of American surveillance equipment. This began with the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes of the Cold War and continued more recently with satellites and camera-equipped drones. According to the CLUI, these targets function like an eye chart of the optometrist, where the smallest group of bars that can be resolved marks the limit of the resolution for the optical equipment that is being used. For aerial photography, it provides a platform to test, calibrate and focus aerial cameras travelling at different speeds and altitudes. The pattern was adopted as a uniform way for the Air Force to test cameras in 1959 and has been updated several times. In 1998, after almost 50 years in use, a military code manual deemed the pattern an outdated standard for new camera parts and insisted that it only be used as a way to test replacement camera equipment. In 2006, after 57 years as the standard for Air Force cameras, the test pattern was retired. Non-film cameras have become more common, and the tri-bar didn't adapt well to digital photography. And from the trinikid.com website. Everybody dies, but no one else will die like these 13 people did. 455 BC. The Athenian author Aeschylus was killed when an eagle dropped a tortoise on his head. In 1327, King Edward II of England was supposedly murdered by having a horn pushed up his anus and a red-hot iron inserted burning out all of his insides, but leaving no mark on his body. In 1567, Hans Steininger, burgomaster of Braunau, broke his neck and died by tripping on his four and a half foot long beard. In 1771, Adolf Frederick 
king of Sweden, had one insanely big meal and ate himself to death. In 1871, an Ohio lawyer named Clement Vallandigham accidentally shot himself trying to show how the victim of the man he was defending could have shot himself instead of being murdered. The defendant was found innocent, but Vallandigham died from the wound. In 1923, George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, died after cutting open a mosquito bite whilst shaving. The wound got infected and he caught pneumonia. In 1958, actor Gareth Jones died in between scenes in a TV play. In the play, his character dies of a heart attack, as did Jones. In 1979, a factory worker at the Ford Motor Company, Robert Williams, became the first person killed by a robot. One of the arms of the factory machines hit him in the head. In 1993, a Toronto lawyer fell from the 24th floor of the Toronto Dominion Centre, throwing himself out a window in order to prove to visitors how unbreakable it was. The window never broke, but popped out of place. In 2007, Jennifer Strange died of bladder failure after trying to win a Nintendo Wii from a radio promotional contest called Hold your we for a we. In 2009, the Canadian folk singer Taylor Mitchell was killed by coyotes. Strangely, this is the only recorded case of dying from this particular species. In 2012, Edward Archibald died of choking after winning a cockroach eating contest. And finally, in 2014, 21-year-old Oscar Otero Aguila died by accidentally shooting himself in the head trying to take a selfie whilst holding a loaded gun. While we're studying the number 13, from the HuffingtonPost.com, a story by Joe Satran. 13 weird moments in the history of water fountains. When was the last time you gave serious thought to a drinking fountain? Maybe it was in elementary school, when they were the only way to wet your whistle. Or maybe never. That would be perfectly understandable. They seem boring, but they're not. Far from it. It turns out the history of drinking fountains is much crazier than I could have imagined. Brace yourselves. In 1859, thousands of people gathered to watch the opening of the first drinking fountain in London. The history of fountains stretches back thousands of years to ancient Crete and Greece, where fountains were fundamental building blocks of early urban life. People came and filled up jugs of water, while others were basically public sculptures that incorporated moving water. But it wasn't until the second half of the 19th century that anyone thought of building a fountain specifically for people to drink water on the go. 
In 1859, a group of wealthy Londoners responding to outbreaks of cholera spread by filthy water formed a group called the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain Association, dedicated to the construction of public drinking fountains in the city using private funds. At the time, many poor people got their water from private companies that hauled it directly from the Thames, which was increasingly polluted by human waste and other effluvia of city life. Free, filtered water was a major boon. The Metropolitan Drinking Fountain Association opened its first drinking fountain in April 1859 and thousands gathered to watch it be turned on. The drinking fountain was so popular that the association opened hundreds more across the UK in the decades that followed. Many of the fountains also included accommodations for watering horses, cows and dogs. In 1867, the name of the group was changed to the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough Association to acknowledge this part of the mission. Secondly, for the next 50 years, people drank water from these fountains using a metal cup attached to the fountain with a chain. Though the look of the large edifice housing fountains varied across decades and from place to place, the central mechanism was remarkably consistent. It featured three main components. A spigot that sent out a continual stream of fresh water, a basin for collecting the water, and a metal cup, attached by a chain to the edifice. That was kept in the basin of water. Thirsty passers-by would grab the metal cup and drink it dry, then put it back into the basin of water. That's right, everyone used the same cup, day in, day out. Although germ theory had, by the 1860s, started to gain acceptance, everyone assumed that the water flowing over the cup would keep it clean, and no one thought that germs could live on a metal cup. They were wrong, of course, but it would take them many decades to realise it. We'll get back to that later. Number three. The need for water fountains was considered so urgent that the New York Times regularly advocated for the installation in New York City for several years. Across the pond, many New Yorkers in the 1850s also wanted drinking fountains. The city gained access to a consistent source of fresh water in 1842 when the Croton Aqueduct started bringing water from northern Westchester County. But it took decades for many poor and working class people to get connections to the distributing reservoir of the Croton which meant that many continued to rely on polluted wells and cisterns. Cholera and other waterborne diseases continued to be serious problems well into the 1850s. Moreover, even for those with tap water in their homes or apartment buildings, there was almost no way to get good drinking water out of the home in the course of people's days. That encouraged urban labourers and flaneurs to stop into saloons and grog houses when they felt thirsty. For all these reasons, the New York Times began regularly editorialising for the installation of drinking fountains almost as soon as the paper was founded in 1851. In one opinion piece from June 1855, for example, the paper wrote, We are not aware of there being a single public fountain in this city of fountains, as it has been absurdly called, at which a weary man may slake his thirst. Number four. New York installed its first drinking fountain just a few months after London, but it took until 1880 for fountains to really take off in the city. New York City heeded the New York Times' call on June 10, 1859, when the city's first public drinking fountain was installed in City Hall Park downtown. The Times reported that crowds gathered to watch it get turned on and added, it is to be hoped that public drinking fountains in this city will soon be so numerous that they cease to be a subject of remark. Just ten days after it was installed, City Council voted down a bill that would have provided funding for 50 more public drinking fountains. In a withering article, the New York Times chalked the decision up to financial interests, noting that fountains have no votes and free fountains can buy none. Grog shops, on the contrary, are notoriously prolific of votes. It wasn't until around 1880 that water fountains really proliferated. 
wealthy residents started underwriting their construction and often emblazoned their name across the fountains. Yet well into the 1880s, new fountains were considered significant enough to warrant news stories in major newspapers, and large crowds would gather to watch them being turned on. In 1881, the New York Times wrote that a thousand people were present at the opening of the water fountain in Union Square. 5. Among the biggest supporters of drinking fountains were temperance groups who thought they would discourage people from drinking so much alcohol. Though the donation of money for fountain building was, at the end of the 19th century, a broadly popular activity for many wealthy people of all persuasions, the most active contingent was temperance activists. They believed that giving urban residents easy access to clean, cold drinking water would discourage them from drinking the more widely available alcohol throughout the day. Temperance advocacy groups, many composed of individuals of average means, would pool their money to build fountains in towns and cities across the country. They would often have words like temperance emblazoned in large letters across the fountains. Many, including the one pictured above, still stand today. 6. At the beginning of the 20th century, people finally realised that common cups were completely disgusting and insane. Remember how people drank from these early drinking fountains using metal cups? Around the turn of the 20th century, health advocates realised that was a terrible idea. The first major figure to speak out against the so-called common cup was Massachusetts Institute of Technology professor William T. Sedgwick. But other public health thinkers followed over the next decade, publishing studies demonstrating that common cups were capable of spreading disease. Ban the Cup campaigns convinced almost every state to pass laws between 1909 and 1912, making common cups illegal. The proprietors of public drinking fountains sought alternate ways of dispensing water. One popular solution was to replace the permanent cup with disposable paper cups, which were invented in 1907. That way, water fountain patrons could still enjoy the same satisfying drinking process they always had, without spreading disease. More often, though, they installed what were then called sanitary drinking fountains, which required no cup at all. Though these had existed since at least 1900, they only became widespread after the Ban the Cup movement took hold. Sanitary drinking fountains came in various shapes and sizes, but most early ones featured a spigot that shot a jet of water straight into the air, like a miniature geyser. 7. For some mysterious reason, Wisconsinites have their own word for drinking fountains. Most people in the United States today refer to them as drinking fountains or water fountains. The two are more or less interchangeable. But when cupless drinking fountains first came into being, some people called them bubblers to differentiate them from the old cup-dependent type. As you can see in the map above, people in Wisconsin still often refer to the devices as bubblers, as apparently do people in Rhode Island and Australia, which is true. It's not entirely clear why. A commonly repeated story says that the Wisconsin-based Cola Co. invented sanitary drinking fountains at the end of the 19th century and called them bubblers, and that state pride has kept the word alive. But a recent story in the Sheboygan Press convincingly disproved this etymology. 8. But bubblers posed another disgusting problem. People put their lips on the faucet. Public health experts quickly realised that eliminating common cups did not eliminate the risk of transferring germs through drinking fountains. The vertical-style jet of drinking fountain encouraged many people, eager to imbibe the full draught of water they were used to, to put their lips directly on top of the spigot, which was almost as unsanitary as using a common cup. Fountain engineers spent years trying to come up with solutions. Many of them attached metal cages to the top of the spigot in an effort to keep people's lips off the nozzle. But this was only partially effective because some people just started putting their lips on the mouth guards instead. Just like people in fictional Pawnee, Indiana, on the TV show Parks and Rec do to this day. 
Around 1920, the powers that be settled on water fountains with slanted jets of water as the safest, most sensible format, and they've remained pretty similar ever since. Ultimately, the problems with vertical jets of water inspired plumbing engineers to settle on another solution entirely, slanted jets. Instead of aiming the spigot straight up, they aimed them at approximately a 45 degree angle and then affixed a mouth guard to the spigot to prevent people from putting their lips directly on it. This method seems largely to have solved the issue of germ transfer. The design has persisted to this day. 10. In Jim Crow southern states, drinking fountains were segregated, making them a locus of the struggle for African American rights. By the 1950s, public drinking fountains were everywhere, setting the stage for them to become a potent focus for debates about the structure of public life. Under Jim Crow laws, drinking fountains were one of the many public amenities segregated by race. For black people living in the South, they became a powerful symbol of the pervasiveness of racist laws. Even though the desegregation of drinking fountains was never considered as important as, say, the desegregation of schools, it nonetheless became a powerful symbol in the struggle for equality. 11. In the late 1980s, drinking fountains became controversial once again because of lead poisoning. Some experts have been concerned about the possible health effects of lead for centuries, but it wasn't until the 1970s that lead poisoning became a national fixation and the Environmental Protection Agency started taking serious measures to limit Americans' exposure to the metal. As part of that effort, EPA employees tested water from school drinking fountains for lead in 1986, and what they found was shocking. Many school drinking fountains were dispensing water that contained dangerously high levels of lead because the design of the fountains included some lead components. Local investigations confirmed that the issue was widespread. Congress conducted hearings on the issue and water fountain manufacturers rushed to develop new designs that eliminated the risk, but the damage to the reputation of the drinking fountain was done. Number 12. Then drinking fountains met their strongest adversary yet, bottled water. Controversies such as the lead poisoning scare may have dented the popularity of drinking fountains, making them vulnerable to competition, which finally came in the 1980s in the form of bottled water. Starting in the late 80s, American consumption of bottled water skyrocketed, rising from about 7 gallons per American in 1987 to 30 gallons per American in 2007. MacArthur fellow Peter Gleick argued in his landmark history, Bottled and Sold, that the rise of bottled water was instrumental in the declining popularity of drinking fountains. There are a host of reasons for that. People think bottled water tastes better, for one, and they don't like sipping from the slanted jets of drinking fountains. Today these fountains are still a fixture of public buildings because building codes require them. But they largely sit forlorn, at least outside elementary schools. And finally, 13. A new dawn may be rising for drinking fountains. In recent years, various forces, including Peter Gleick, not to mention the EPA, have tried to reverse the movement against drinking fountains. They argue that the consumption of bottled water is wasteful on several levels, and that we should embrace drinking fountains as a far more sustainable economic alternative. Some have proposed installing new, better drinking fountains, such as the one pictured above in London's Hyde Park, as a way to encourage their use. There's even an app that helps people find drinking fountains in public places, it's too early to say whether these efforts will succeed, but if the last 150 years have shown anything, it's that drinking fountains are resilient. Well, there you go. I bet you didn't know that drinking fountains were so interesting and a little bit mysterious as well. And if you'd like to visit the show notes and visit this article in episode 104, there is a photograph to go with each section or a photograph or a drawing, and some of them are quite good actually, so it's definitely worth a look. And the new drinking fountain in number 13 looks pretty cool. Sort of a mushroom-shaped looking thing that's very shiny, and the kids seem to be having a good time playing with it. Hmm, 
the bed. Probably a better idea than those wasteful plastic bottles of water. Come and visit Australia, the land down under. How often do we say that and encourage you to visit my beautiful country? But while you're here, just watch out for a few of the nasties. The dangerous saltwater crocodile, our sharks, our snakes, our dangerous spiders, and our marine stingers. And of course there is the cassowary, which I did in an article in one of the podcasts recently, which is the world's most dangerous bird. So after you've been through all that, there's only one thing left. Plants. Being stung by the gimpy gimpy tree is the worst kind of pain you can imagine. And this is from the odditycentral.com website, and it's written by Sumitra. We actually have some stinging trees in the botanic gardens. Not so much the gimpy gimpy, but the shiny leaf stinging tree, which is a relative. And, of course, it's trimmed with its branches nice and high, so the leaves can't touch the visitors. But for those of you who don't know anything about this mysterious plant, here it comes. Gimpy gimpy is hardly the name you'd expect for a stinging tree. It looks quite harmless too, but in reality, the gimpy gimpy is one of the world's most venomous plants. Commonly found in the rainforest areas of northeastern Australia, the Moluccas and Indonesia, it is known to grow up to one to two metres in height. In fact, the gimpy gimpy sting is so dangerous, it has been known to kill dogs, horses and humans alike. If you're lucky enough to survive, you only feel excruciating pain that can last several months and reoccur for years. Even a dry specimen can inflict pain almost a hundred years after being picked. With the exception of its roots, every single part of the deadly tree, its heart-shaped leaves, its stem and its pink-purple fruit is covered with tiny stinging hairs shaped like hypodermic needles. You only need to lightly touch the plant to get stung, after which the hair penetrates the body and releases a painful toxin called moroidin. Sometimes merely being in the presence of the plant and breathing the hair that it sheds into the air can cause itching, rashes, sneezing and terrible nosebleeds. According to virologist Dr. Mike Lee, the first thing you'll feel is a really intense burning sensation and this grows over the next half hour, becoming more and more painful. Shortly after this your joints may ache and you might get swelling under your armpits, which can almost be as painful as the original sting. In severe cases this can lead to shock and even death, and if you don't remove all the hair from your skin, they can keep releasing the tortuous toxins for up to a year. The Gimpy Gimpy serves as an unexpected hazard in rainforest clearings for foresters, surveyors and timber workers. Even scientists who are aware of the plant's notoriety can sometimes become unsuspecting victims. That's why most professionals do not venture out into such areas without respirators, thick gloves and antihistamine tablets. Being stung is the worst kind of pain you can imagine, like being burnt with hot acid and electrocuted at the same time, said entomologist and ecologist Marina Hurley, who was stung during the three years she spent in Queensland's Atherton Tableland. She was a postgraduate student at James Cook University at the time, investigating the herbivores that eat stinging trees. The allergic reaction developed over time, causing extreme itching and huge hives that eventually required steroid treatment. At that point, my doctor advised that I should have no further contact with the plant, and I didn't object. One of the first people to document the adverse effects of the Gimpy Gimpy sting was North Queensland road surveyor A.C. McMillan, who reported it to his boss in 1866 that his pack horse was stung, got mad and died within two hours. Local folklore is also filled with similar tales of horses in agony jumping off cliffs and forestry workers drinking copiously in order to dull the pain. In 1994, 
Australian ex-serviceman Cyril Bromley described how he happened to fall into the tree during military training. He was subsequently strapped to a hospital bed for three weeks and administered all sorts of treatments that proved unsuccessful. He described it as the worst period of his life, when the pain made him as mad as a cut snake. He also told the story of an officer who shot himself after using a leaf for toilet purposes. Most of the known cures for a gimpy gimpy sting are rather rudimentary. Analgesics are usually prescribed for minor exposure to the plant. An innovative local remedy involves sticking a plaster or a hair waxing strip in order to rip all the toxic hairs away from the skin. Interestingly, the British Army is believed to have displayed unusual interest in the properties of the Gimpy Gimpy and its sinister applications in the late 1960s. The Chemical Defence Establishment at Porton Down, a top-secret laboratory that developed chemical weapons, contacted Alan Seawright in 1968, asking him to provide specimens of the stinging tree. Alan, who was then a professor of pathology at the University of Queensland, said... Chemical warfare is their work, so I could only assume that they were investigating its potential as a biological weapon. I never heard anything more, so I guess we'll never know, he added. And if you visit the show notes, there are some photographs of the leaves and the hairs on the leaves and a short video entitled, Why You Don't Want to Touch the Gimpy Gimpy Plant. So everyone who doesn't live in Australia, come for a visit. It's a pretty safe place. As long as you don't go in the bush, as long as you don't go swimming, as long as you don't sort of touch a spider or a snake, it's a pretty safe place, really. Relics and artefacts uncovered throughout the centuries have provided an immense knowledge base about how our ancient ancestors lived, what they believed in and what skills they had. Occasionally an astonishing find challenges our understanding of ancient societies and cultures and provides surprising new information about civilizations of the past. One such find was the discovery of four cone-shaped golden hats from the Bronze Age. From one of my favourite websites, I really like this one, ancientorigins.net, a story by M. R. Rees. The mystery of the four golden hats of the Bronze Age. Discovered in different locations and at different times, the four gold hats share many similarities in shape, size, design and construction. Their conical design mimics the well-known image of a witch's or wizard's hat, leading to speculation that the hats were worn by individuals who held such a position. The hats are engraved with symbols that may have been used to make agricultural and or astronomical predictions, possibly raising the wearer to divine status. The four gold hats are rare archaeological finds dating back to the Bronze Age which lasted from 3300 to 700 BC. The hats all appear to have been created sometime around the middle of this period, ranging from 1400 to 800 BC. They were each discovered separately over the course of 160 years in different locations, three of them in Germany and one in France. There is, of course, the possibility that more gold hats will be uncovered in the future. The golden relics are constructed of sheets of gold with intricate astronomical designs and demonstrate superb craftsmanship. While the four hats bear striking similarities, they are also somewhat unique in their specific features. The first hat was discovered in 1835 at Schifferstadt, Germany. 
It is called the Golden Hat of Schifferstadt. The Golden Hat of Schifferstadt was uncovered by a farmer and appeared to have been intentionally buried. It is the shortest of the four hats, standing at 29.6 centimetres high. It is divided into bands that run the full length of the hat, with each band decorated with one of several designs, including circles, dish shapes and eye-like shapes. The Golden Hat of Schifferstadt is believed to have been manufactured sometime between 1400 and 1300 BC. The second hat discovered is the Avanton Gold Cone, discovered in Avanton, France in 1844. The Avanton hat is believed to have been created between 1000 and 900 BC and is the only one missing a brim. However, signs of damage indicate that the Avanton hat did have a brim at one point. The cone stands at 55 centimetres. The Avanton hat is also banded with repeated circle symbols. The third hat discovered is the Golden Cone of Eseldorf Book, discovered near Eseldorf, Germany in 1953. The Golden Cone of Eseldorf Book stands as the tallest of the four hats at 88 centimetres tall and contains the same banded design with repeated circles, discs and eye-like shapes. It is believed to have originated between 1000 and 900 BC. The provenance of the fourth gold hat is less clear, but is believed to have been found in either southern Germany or Switzerland. It was noticed in the international arts trade in 1995. The hat originates from 1800 BC and is known as the Berlin Gold Hat because it was purchased by the Berlin Museum. It stands 75 centimetres tall with the same banded pattern as the others. The purpose of the gold hats is unknown. While they were each found in different areas, speculations have evolved around the hats as a group, under the assumption that they were all used for similar purposes. For some time, the hats were believed to be symbols of fertility, perhaps due to their phallic shape. Researchers once believed that the hats were part of an ancient suit of armour, or that they were used as ceremonial vases. Later, the hats were believed to have been placed upon stakes at sites of worship, to serve as decorative caps. It has also been speculated that the four hats once belonged to ancient wizards, due to their resemblance to wizard-style hats. As of recently, German archaeologists and historians believe that the hats were in fact used by individuals who would have been viewed as wizards during the Bronze Age. According to these recent theories, the astrological symbols were used to track the stars and the sun, which allowed for agricultural predictions, namely when to plant and harvest. The figures who wore the hats were referred to as king priests, because they were able to make predictions and were therefore believed to have supernatural powers. While predictions of time and weather are commonplace today due to modern knowledge and technology, the ability to predict climate conditions during the Bronze Age was seen as a divine power. Wilfred Mengen, director of the Berlin Museum, has been extensively studying the hats. According to Mengen, the king priests would have been regarded as lords of time who had access to a divine knowledge that enabled them to look into the future. According to Mengen, the sun and moon symbols are a match with the Metonic cycle, which provides an explanation of the time relationship between the sun and the moon. The knowledge that this pattern provided would have allowed for long-term predictions of sun and moon cycles. Overall, this shows that those who inhabited Europe during the Bronze Age were far more sophisticated than initially believed. It is easy to see how the ability to make such long-term astrological predictions would give one the appearance of having divine or magical powers back in the Bronze Age. Perhaps the idea that the gold hats were worn by ancient wizards isn't a legend or a myth, but a true reflection of how the wearers were viewed due to their ability to predict time. The discovery of the four gold hats has provided a fascinating insight into life and practices of those who lived around three millennia ago. The use of the hats to predict the movements of the sun and the time relationship between the sun and the moon isn't entirely novel, as many ancient artefacts indicate much focus on such astrological features. But why they chose to express such knowledge on golden hats is still unclear. Perhaps with further research, we will someday know why the wizards of the Bronze Age wore these spectacular hats of gold. 
And if you visit the show notes, they have some very nice photographs of these four hats. And they are very intricate and quite beautiful. Amazing work for the Bronze Age. Definitely worth a look. And from the yourghoststories.com website, The Borley Rectory Hauntings. What binds a non-earthly soul to the physical dimension? From history and research, it seems that it generally lends to a life cut short, usually traumatic in some way, or unsolved business. There are enough allegations of emotionally charged events at the Borley Rectory located near the Suffolk border in the eastern portion of England to fill all of those requirements. During a seance co-held by Harry Price, a paranormal investigator who had leased the premise in the late 30s from Reverend Lionel Foister and his wife Marianne, he would uncover what he felt to be one of the strongest presences at Borley Rectory. But before we reveal the results of that seance, a brief history of the house is in order. The history of Borley Rectory begins with the building of a Gothic Benedictine monastery in the 13th century. Those were not genteel times, and legend has it that a monk and his lovely young love interest, a nun from a nearby convent, were both done in while trying to elope the establishment and start a new life together. They were captured and the monk was hung while his fiancée was walled up, alive in the cold walls of her convent. Two lovers torn apart, to be isolated forever. Was it she who had been seen wafting through the garden, head bent in sorrow? Was she the girl in white who roamed the property, searching for her lost love? After its stint as a monastery, it was sold off as a residence, and a rectory was soon added in 1862 by Reverend Henry Bull and his family. Reverend Bull had become pastor of Borley Church in 1862 and, despite local warnings, built the rectory on a site believed by locals to be haunted. Over the years, Bull's servants and his daughters were repeatedly unnerved by phantom rappings, unexplained footsteps and the appearance of ghosts. Reverend Bull seemed to find these happenings as wildly entertaining as he and his son Harry even constructed a summer house on the property where they could enjoy after-dinner cigars and pleasurably idle away the time waiting for an appearance of the phantom nun who roamed the property. After Reverend Bull passed on in one of the more famous of the haunted rooms, the Blue Room, his son Harry inherited the establishment and position until he himself passed on in 1927. Following Harry's footsteps was Reverend Guy Smith, who was so unnerved by the spectral sights and sounds that he left the rectory just one year after moving in. After Smith's hasty departure, the house was then inhabited by Reverend Lionel Foister and his wife Marianne, The house only seemed to be getting warmed up as their experiences grew in intensity and frequency. Without any explanation, they found themselves locked out of rooms. Windows would suddenly smash, and personal items would vanish under their noses. It wasn't uncommon for them to hear unnerving noises from all over the house. As time went on, These mischievous antics turned aggressive and Marianne was actually accosted one evening. She was thrown off her bed in the middle of the night and even slapped by invisible hands of which she was helpless to do anything about. The final straw was when she was nearly made unconscious by a mattress that was held over her face. Someone obviously didn't like Marianne. Perhaps it was jealousy from a female ghost that caused these physical transgressions. The involvement of Harry Price came about after a paper asked him to investigate these poltergeists' activity following a popular story written by the paper. It was during his investigation that writings on the wall started to appear, usually when Marianne was present. 
the writing's ghostly owner seemed more sympathetic to Marianne compared to the other ghosts, as some of the messages scrawled were, Marianne, please get help, and Marianne, light mass prayers. Price was more of a guest at the manor until the Foisters moved out in 1935, at which point he leased the house for a full year for deeper investigation. Now that Price had the house to himself for an extended period, he ran an ad for other paranormal investigators to help him monitor and document the ghostly activities. He had to weed through some not-so-savoury types, though, but he ended up working with 40 people to uncover some of the fascinating history of Borley Rectory. During a seance, an alleged spirit named Marie Lair came through and told the group that she had been a nun in France, but had left her convent to marry Henry Waldgrave, the son of a wealthy family whose home had previously stood on the site of Borley Rectory. The tale turned grim when she declared that her husband had taken her life and placed her remains in the cellar. To Price, she seemed to fit the profile of the ghost that haunted Borley Rectory. One spirit during a seance even gave a fascinating prediction that the former nun's body would be found in the ruins. Though the spirit said the house would burn down that night, thus revealing the location of the bones, it wasn't until eleven months later that a fire was started by the new owner, Captain W. H. Gregson, as he was unpacking the library books, when an oil lamp fell over and started a fire. The fire spread fast through the manor, and the rectory was in shambles, later to be demolished in 1944. Since previously unattainable areas were now exposed, Price decided to excavate the cellar, where he indeed found a few small bones, which seemed to be those of a young woman. Was this proof needed to validate the story of the betrayed nun? Regardless who the woman was, she was given a proper religious burial and finally laid to rest. You're travelling through another dimension, began Rod Sterling's introduction to the Twilight Zone television series and the experience Chloe relates could serve as the basis for one of the show's scripts. Upon returning to her home one night after work, something was wrong, out of kilter, didn't make sense, and ultimately is unexplained. This is Chloe's story. From the paranormal.about.com website, a story by Stephen Wagner. Home in another dimension. Recently something has been disturbingly wrong. Twisted. I live in East Tennessee with my mother, father, older brother and a friend who is temporarily staying with me. On the Saturday after Valentine's Day of 2012, my father Richard took my mother Vicky to the Martha Washington Hotel in North Carolina. My mother just adores its history. It's known to be haunted. My dad says that when he walks into that eerie place, the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. I find it humorous that he is scared and she isn't. Anyway, upon their returning, things went missing and later showed up in random places throughout the house. My father always keeps his keys and wallet on the nightstand, but every morning they are on the floor in the centre of the bedroom. But things have gotten worse, even crazy. On the night of February 23rd, 2012, my friend Savannah and I, the friend who lives with me, got off work and rode home together. We arrived there at about 10.29. While pulling into the driveway, I noticed that every light in the house was off, which is extremely strange. My parents always sit on the couch in the living room, with at least the lamp on. Before we entered the house, I tried calling the house phone, but there was no answer. I called my father's cell phone. No answer. Lastly, when I attempted to reach my mother through her cell phone, she indeed answered the phone, but didn't respond to anything I said. She did this twice. On the phone with my brother, he advised us to go inside because my parents are known for the occasional practical joke. We entered through the garage and tried to get my dog to come with us. She stayed outside the door instead, which again seemed odd. 
I turned on the hall light and proceeded to walk to my parents' room and noticed that their bedsheets were hanging on the door. I walked in to see their mattress pulled off the bed to one side. At this point I was a little on edge. So I jogged to the living room calling out to them, but there was no response. Had they been there, they would have heard me. I still do not doubt that. We left the house and got into my car to call my brother. He instructed us to meet him so he could come back with us and check it out. At this point my voice was shaking as bad as my hands had been. This is where things get unusually scary. Not two minutes down the road, I received a text from my mother that read, Are you two running late? I called her and she was upset that we weren't home. She sounded concerned and was about to send my dad out to look for us because we had not returned home. I sped home in an attempt to catch them in the prank. When I pulled into the driveway, things appeared normal. Upon entering the house, we noticed that their bed was neatly made and they were sitting on the couch watching the housewives of Orange County, as always. When we told them what had happened, they looked baffled. We've been sitting on this couch since seven, Chloe. Where have you been? After explaining in more detail, they began to worry. My dad retreated to his room and my mother almost cried. They swore that they had been there for hours, but just minutes earlier Savannah and I had been in the same empty, dark room. When I think back to last night, I notice now that when entering the house for the first time, something felt wrong, almost as if we were not in a worldly dimension. It has bothered me ever since. Where were we? Personal encounters with UFOs and possible abductions are the most puzzling and frightening experiences in paranormal records. It's not just the sighting of the unusual aerial craft, it's the accompanying high strangeness. In the case of Paul Schroeder, his encounter was followed by poltergeist activity, telepathy and other unexplained events, all of which question the true nature and meaning of these alien experiences. This is Paul's story. So this is also from the paranormal.about.com by Stephen Wagner, and it's entitled The Night of Unseen Entities. It started at 8pm Saturday night, December 2, 2006, after a series of ice storms in New York. The ground ice crunched under my feet. White, blue, icy snow covered the sidewalks underfoot. Overhead was a low, thick ceiling of clouds. The temperature was about 30 degrees and very little wind. While walking down my driveway towards my backyard pantry door, I glanced up and almost dropped my groceries. UFOs were assembling overhead, their engines glowing dark red against the blackness. I stared, puzzled at a strange but not yet disturbing or revealing sight. A clean, crisp hole was cut into the overcast, revealing bright stars surrounding the reddish circular craft bottoms. It was as though a cookie cutter had sliced a clean, mile-wide circular hole in the cloud cover. Everywhere else was thickly overcast, but almost at zenith was a perfect circle of clearing. My mind could not accept the sudden realisation. What looked like a child's red balloon floated into view, a bright red against the stars and outlined blackness. The first red balloon stopped, then was joined by two more, which floated in and hovered equidistant from the first. All three, now four, five, six, seven, eight, nine balloons hung overhead and stopped in the centre of the cloud hole. As I stared upward at neck-breaking zenith, puzzled at their no longer drifting motion, three more floated into view at the rear of the glowing formation a flotilla of closely assembled red balloons. They all hung motionless overhead. I slowly, for the first time, felt a sense of awe grow, and my mouth fell open with raw wonder. One more joined slowly from the rear, assembling north to south. An impossible group of nine or ten escaped red children's balloons. What could they be? Balloons drift with the wind, I wondered. They're not migrating hovering birds. What are they? I stared in wonder, awe tingling my forehead, stomach and arms. My mind reached out to them for a long minute in intensity. 
Their colour changed from bright red to light lavender purple all together, all at once. Quickly flashing away like minnows in a pond, they peeled off in pairs from west to east, heading out towards Montauk. They were gone in several seconds, leaving the hole overhead, still twinkling with stars, but empty of craft. I'm convinced that this sighting has everything to do with the onset of spiritual and mind experiences of high strangeness. Did they climb down the ladder of my oar to find me? Or is it that my sighting was no accident? Which one came first, the chicken or the egg? Maybe it was the farmer that came first. Was that circle in the clouds necessary for their visibility, or was it designed for me needing visibility? These meddling, harassing, unseen entities may be, in fact, the occupants of those craft I stared at. I cannot be truly alone. There must be many like me, aware, resistant, troubled, and amazed. If nothing else, these critters operating those craft have renewed wonder in my life. That long lost sense of awe and also have renewed much faith. But they've also destroyed the actuality of getting a good night's sleep. My sleep is now replete with danger and loss of control of consciousness. Now as I sleep, my astral body wanders among beasties and monsters. Memory. A tapping delicately on my back. I am sitting upon a table, feeling gentle taps on my back, watching a series of images, myriad tables receding into infinity, like two mirrors facing each other, farmers milking cows. On each table a person sits up and is examined by a small, slim, white, intent, fragile, large-eyed creature. Their fingers probe lightly, gently, purposefully, like a piano playing. They are milking chakras or kundalini nerve centers, several along each person's spine. Their touches stimulate hidden DNA sequences as well as retrieve and store data and information along the length of the spinal cord, along a library of nerves. Like ants milking aphids, they spend careful time and effort gently, delicately fingering each spine in a long sequence of tables like marionettes playing human harpsichords. These manipulations of spinal nerves initiate secret, as yet unbidden DNA sequences, which dangerously age and disease and trouble the somatic body and mind of an abductee. After an incident, my finger and toenails had to be trimmed twice every day. These are horrible psychic and emotional results from activation of these spinal sequences too quickly as well. Interdimensional leaking occurs. One senses other unworldly creatures and flirts with the beast of madness. What is subtly being programmed, stored and retrieved in our spinal cords? We are Manchurian candidates of stellar proportions. Is the interdimensional bleeding through into our dimension? Pranks predominate. Other objects appear to return days later in strange places. There's always a powerful sense of being watched by large eyes. On a Tuesday afternoon in late June, I entered the back of the house, passing by an enormous four-foot-wide, four-foot-tall flower pots, each weighing as much as a man, containing ten-foot-tall canna plants, looking tropical in nature and in full bloom. I opened the back door and entered the vestibule into the kitchen. I could not take another step. Glancing backward over my shoulder, I saw that both enormous pots had been turned over. The white elephant ear-like leaves and tall orange-red flower tops now bloomed sideways, sprawled to the ground in a fraction of a second. I became suddenly aware of a very untoward realisation. I would likely need entity removal and aura cleaning and protection, as in addition to this poltergeist nonsense, I was besieged with elements of telepathic attack, nightly evil nightmares, a sense of pervading anxiety and a confluence of accidents and surgeries. And all these experiences after my sightings of UFOs and recalling some abductions. Presence of mind is our greatest weapon. The ridicule factor is their best defence. Who, in one's right mind, can even discuss these things? Paper is indeed much more patient than people. Why did things get worse? In deep despair and confusion, 
The overturned plants overwhelmed me with poltergeist shock that was so sudden and so profound, I stopped and prayed aloud for a spiritual sign. God, if there is a spirit world and it's real, I prayed, and I can ask for protection, send me a sign. God, send me a white bird up close and personal, in my face, on my window as a sign. I put my whole heart and soul and angst into this prayer. Minutes later, busy elsewhere, I forgot it as it promptly receded into the recesses of my mind. The next day on route to work, following the same path I always drive, I made a right turn. High over the street of cars, I saw a cloud of some one hundred gulls hovering, wheeling and circling overhead, as if attracted by a garbage or a dumpster, although none was in evidence. As I glanced up at the raucous flock, one gull swerved to within an inch of my windshield, glossed past and made eye contact with me. It lasted maybe two seconds. Preoccupied with driving and have totally forgotten my fervent spiritual request from the night before, I drove on, momentarily startled, but dully aware of its significance. After a strenuous day at work, I returned home, lit a prayer candle and began to voice again my special request for a sign when I remembered the morning gull. I had asked for a white bird on my window, up close and personal. Had I been given that sign the very next morning? I decided to be sceptical but not cynical. What would be a critical test? I decided that if I saw any gulls in the area anywhere while in transit on the way to work for the next two weeks, I would know that it was a coincidence or a quirk of fate and not the sign that I asked for. Repeatedly in my mind's eye, I was haunted with an odd after-image, a close-up of the bird's black bead-like eye. Why was the black eye of that bird, which whizzed past so fast, so fixed in my mind? For two weeks each day I scanned the horizon and landscape for a sign of gulls hovering, as I believed a flock so large would certainly reappear somewhere. I never saw one bird. I decided that I had been given a wonderful sign, and it has given me the courage and the confidence to feel protected in this fight against the unseen, harassing entities. The music for today's podcast came from the musicalley.com. The bandwidth was provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. The show notes are kept at the Origins podcast website, www.origins.info. And we have a Facebook link at www.facebook.com forward slash Paul Rexy, or just click on the link at the show notes. I'd like to thank these people who have given a donation to the podcast over the past few weeks. Your help is greatly appreciated everyone and helps to keep the podcast viable so it's a big thank you to these people William Foster Linda Simmons Kimberly Hyatt Jeff Chapman Wendy Decker and Luke Hewson thank you everyone your help is greatly appreciated well everyone that concludes episode 104 of the Mysteries Abound podcast hope you enjoyed today's podcast and until next time whether it be the Origins podcast or this one this is Paul saying bye for now and Keep well, everyone.